Senator ICAC Senator and this Pratt government needs being, to get on with it. Senator Pratt, it being 2 p.m., we will move to questions without notice. Senator McAllister. Uh, thanks very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Can the minister confirm that six months after it was announced in this year's budget, not a cent of the $260 million promised in the National Partnership Agreement on Family, Domestic and Sexual Violence has been paid to the states and territories to distribute to frontline services? The Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you, Senator McAllister, for your question. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, um, to be able to inform the Chamber today um, that the agreement has been signed with the New South Wales Government and the money has been uh, uh, to be paid to them under the $260 million uh, investment that we've made in frontline services. But, that, but that's, in, uh, in addition, that's in addition to the $130 million that was paid during the COVID pandemic to make sure that frontline services uh, were able to be able to have the additional resources to be able to support women and children who, unfortunately, we saw an increase in demand for those services. Uh, but we, uh, we made sure that that $130 million went straight to the states and territories last year and went straight to frontline services. Um, but in recognition that the impact of domestic violence and family violence as a result of the pandemic did not end at the end of June this year, it continues to impact on our communities. We put in place an additional $130 million per year. That's $130 million per year, somewhat over two years, $130 million over two years, somewhat more than $153 million over five, um, to make sure that the, the states and territories are in a position to be, continue to support these frontline services. Uh, in, in return for this, we have asked the states and territories to provide us with information so we can make sure that the money is being targeted to the areas of greatest demand. And I acknowledge today um, New South Wales has uh, come forward and provided us with that additional information so that we can know as a country from a national perspective what actually is the issue. Because, as I said this morning in my contribution, we need to make sure that every single dollar, every single resource that is applied to eliminating family, sexual and domestic violence in this country is targeted Order. and coordinated in the best possible way. Yeah. Because this is a shared responsibility. It doesn't just belong to the federal government. State and territory governments have a responsibility to, and we will continue to work with them to make sure that Minister. happens. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. In October, this minister promised that there would be a meeting of the Women's Safety Ministers' Task Force in November and that, and I quote, one of the most important things that will be addressed at that meeting will be the draft of the next national plan to end violence against women and their children. There are five days left in November. Does the minister still intend to keep her promise? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And as Senator McAllister should know, if she doesn't know, um, that obviously getting together a, a group of very busy ministers across the country sometimes is not able to be uh, to live it within the exact time frame. But I can assure Senator McAllister and everybody in this chamber and everybody uh, listening, the absolute priority of this government is to make sure that the next national plan, uh, which is in final stages of its draft, uh, the draft will be uh, consulted through the appropriate mechanism which are the, uh, the advisory group, uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Council, uh, through the, uh, the victim survivor groups uh, and also through the Women's Safety Ministers Task Force made up of women's safety ministers across the whole of the country, uh, will meet all of the necessary targets and timelines so that it is in place along with the action plans and the implementation plans Order. to meet the timeline for the next national plan and associated plans to commence on 1 July 2022 when the existing plan expires. Senator McAllister, a second supplementary. How can Australians believe that the Morrison-Joyce government will deliver any of its promises on domestic violence when it has failed to deliver on its past promises, leaving Australian women more vulnerable as a result? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, I am not going to take that kind of ridiculous statement from those on the other side. This government has invested more than any other government in keeping Australian women safe. $1.1 billion as a down payment on the next national plan, off the back of $340 million on the fourth action plan. And I'd like to ask the Chamber, does anybody know how much money the Labor Party put against the first 
action plan. The first action plan of the 12-year plan put in place with bipartisan support by Julia Gillard, who was the Prime Minister at the time, absolutely nothing, not one cent invested in the first action plan by those opposite. And they come in here when we have made absolute commitment, and I will continue to reiterate Order. to the Australian women who need the support nice that word. this government is totally committed to doing two things. Order. We're committed to listening to you and we are committed to delivering for you. That is not something that anybody on that side has any credibility in. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. And my question is also to the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Noting that today is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, can the Minister outline to the Senate the Liberal and National Government's commitment to addressing this critical issue? The Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And can I thank Senator Askew for her question and also her ongoing interest and advocacy on this particular issue. Well, today it is really, really important that we reflect and acknowledge the absolute blight that family, sexual and domestic violence is on our nation. One in four Australian women uh, experience sexual violence and one in, in six Australian women experience physical violence at the hands of a partner since they reach the age of 15. And the lifetime impact of that family, sexual and domestic violence is absolutely devastating on survivors. That is why we made the largest ever commitment uh, into supporting Australian women with our $1.1 billion investment in the 21-22 budget. And whilst those on the other side will seek to play politics and claim that we are not interested in addressing this issue, what I would say is look at our track record. We are addressing this issue and we will continue to do so. Just last month, we rolled out the $164 million uh, escaping violence payment, a program which was the first of its kind in a national scale to provide women who make that extraordinary brave decision to leave a, a violent relationship by providing them with $5,000 of supports to make sure that they have got a platform in which to build a new life for themselves and their children. And we've already heard a number of really positive stories about women who've accessed that support. We also hosted the first ever National Women's Safety Summit, and we will continue to make sure that we provide the resources in all areas of responsibility, whether it be leadership, prevention, early intervention, most particularly providing that $260 million in the National Partnership Agreement, providing safe places so women have got somewhere to go, making sure that we can keep women safe in their homes when it is safe to do so. I want to say to every single Australian, we are, are listening to you and we are acting. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how important is listening to the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait women as the government works towards ending violence against women and their children? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Well, as policy makers, we must not just listen, we must recognise and we must include the voices and the wishes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and girls and empower them to develop and deliver programs for their own communities. That's why today we announced the $2.8 billion to deliver the final stages of Commissioner June Oscar's Women's Voices project and to start the process of drafting a dedicated action plan to provide real and tangible results on the ground for First Nations women under the next national plan. And this will include a summit that will be chaired by Commissioner Oscar. Uh, and the summit will focus on women's leadership within Indigenous communities and decision making, as well as obviously delivering the extraordinary important issue of family, domestic and sexual violence within those communities. On International Day for Elimination of Violence Against Women, it's important not just as a government but as a country we reaffirm our commitment to Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander women and girls. Senator Askew, a second supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister update the Senate on how the government is protecting women and children by encouraging respectful behaviours in the community? Minister. Order. Mm. Order. Minister, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Ending violence against women and children is everybody's business. And if we really are going to end violence against women and their children and all members of our community, we must give people the tools and the education 
to understand how their behaviours and their words impact on other people. And we must start a conversation nationally about respectful behaviours and around consent. And that's why we have announced that we are investing an additional $21 million to extend our hugely successful Stop It at the Start campaign. This campaign gives people the tools and the confidence to be able to call out disrespectful behaviours and attitudes. Evaluation research has shown that it is encouragingly, and we've seen some positive results within the community, with more than two thirds of Australians actually recognising this campaign and 73 per cent of people saying that they actually were inspired to act and call out disrespect. We must make sure every Australian knows how to do that and does Minister, it. Your time has expired. Senator Ayres. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, the minister told the Senate that Mr Morrison had counselled Mr Christensen about his online activities, which have incited violent and threatening comments directed at Premier Andrews and Catherine King MP. Senator Birmingham then had to correct the record to admit that Mr Morrison had in fact done nothing, and it was Mr Joyce who had done so. Why has Mr Morrison not spoken to Mr Christensen directly? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, Mr Christensen is a member of the National Party and Mr Joyce is the leader of the National Party. Oh, that's Senator, pathetic. Senator, order, 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 order. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. So much for leadership. After three days of questions in the Senate, comments on Mr Christensen's telegram posts have been completely wiped overnight and the ability to comment has been disabled. Who made that decision? Minister. Thanks, Mr President. Well, I assume the ultimate decision was made by whoever the administrator of, uh, of those accounts are, which I would assume to be the member for Dawson. Senator, Senator order, order. On my right, Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. Minister, has Mr Morrison spoken directly with Mr Christensen about his call yesterday in the House for civil disobedience? Minister. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. Well, I think Mr Morrison spoke to, uh, to Mr Christensen in the House and through that the nation in relation to, uh, to those remarks. Uh, uh, Mr Christensen, uh, Mr Morrison, Mr Morrison in the House, in the House made clear made clear in relation to his view Order. that every single person should obey the law Order. and that no one should encourage anyone Senator to disobey the law. Uh, they are the words that Mr Morrison made very clear in the House right. in relation to a question on and this on matter yesterday. Senator Order. Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Attorney General. In October 2018, the Prime Minister was asked what his message was for gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender and gender diverse students who faced being expelled from school simply for being themselves. The Prime Order. Minister said, and I quote, that their Order. PM understands and is going to take action to fix it. Attorney General, it's been three years. Why, instead of removing discrimination Order. against Senator students, are you rushing through legislation Senator that's a Trojan horse for hate? and legislation that's going to increase the ability to discriminate against LGBTIQ students rather than to protect them. Uh, I call the Attorney General, Senator Cash. Thank you, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Rice for the question. And uh, Senator Rice, the premise that you have put in relation to the Religious Discrimination Bill that the Prime Minister today introduced into the House of Representatives is actually wrong. It is actually wrong. You would be aware that Australia is a religiously and culturally diverse Order. country. We have an Age Discrimination Act, we have a Racial Discrimination Act, we have a Disability Discrimination Act and, Senator Order. Rice, as you know, we have a Sex Discrimination Act. But what we currently don't have Order. in this country is protections for people of faith and those who don't have faith. We seek to fill that gap. Senator Rice, you would already be aware that under the Sex Discrimination Act 
And these, these protections or exemptions for religious bodies have been in place for many, many years, supported by both sides of parliament. In fact, in 2013, when Mr Dreyfus was the Attorney General, he made amendments to the Sex Discrimination Act, but ensured at the same time that the protections for religious bodies were maintained. But in relation to the Religious Discrimination Act, Mr. President, this is about protecting people of faith and those who don't have a faith from discrimination. The summation you have put to the Senate, Senator Rice, is just wrong. Senator Rice, a supplementary question. The, the Prime Minister said he was going to take action to protect LGBTIQ students, yet the only action we've seen is an inquiry by the Australian Law Reform Commission that can't report before 2023. Students who started high school in 2018 will have graduated before the inquiry reports. And Minister Stoke on radio this morning was very clear that this bill will continue to allow to schools to sack teachers on the basis of their sexuality and gender. Is this yet another time where the Prime Minister has lied to save his political skin? The, on the point of order. That clearly needs to be withdrawn. It's an, a reflection on the Prime Minister. Uh, Senator McKim on the point of order. Yeah, just briefly on the point of order. Senator Rice was asking a question. She was not making an assertion. There is, there is no protection merely in asking a question if something is a direct imputation against the member of another place. I will ask you to withdraw the last part of the question and then I will allow the minister to answer. I will withdraw and reword. No, no. Just you just withdraw. Thank you, Senator Rice. The Attorney General has the call. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And Senator Rice, the Religious Discrimination Bill would only prohibit discrimination on the basis of religious belief or activity, and its exemptions only operate in relation to that prohibition. It will not, in any way, affect the current exemptions that religious bodies have and, as I said, that the Labor Party supported and, in fact, Mr Dreyfus, when he was the Attorney General, he himself recognised and we all voted for the fact that when changes were made to the Sex Discrimination Act, Mr President, the exemptions would continue to apply to religious bodies. Senator Rice, in relation to students, the Prime Minister and I have made it very clear to the ALRC. We have a very clear expectation that no student should be expelled from a school because of their sexual identity. Minister, S Senator Rice, just before you ask your second supplementary question, I, um, you did need to withdraw. However, I should have let you restate the question, so I apologise for that. But let's move to your second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. Attorney General, can you confirm that under this legislation it will be legal for someone to tell their sporting teammate that it's sinful for them as a single mother to have a child outside marriage, or that it's the work of the devil that their lesbian neighbour is lesbian and needs to find a husband, and it will be legal for someone to say that they don't recognise their trans woman colleague as a woman and insist on referring to them as male? The Attorney General. Uh the bill provides Senator Rice, and I would hope we could all Order. agree with this, that simply stating one's religious beliefs, or in the case of an atheist, the fact that you don't have a belief in good faith, in and of itself, is not discrimination. If Senator Rice, as the way you have put it, you're implying it would be a malicious statement, it would be a statement perhaps with intent to intimidate, threaten, harass then that clearly, Mr President, is not acceptable. But I would believe in Australia that the ability of people of faith and not of faith to freely discuss their religion or lack of religion, to freely be able to Order. explain their religion or lack of religion Order is something, Mr sides. President, that each and every one of us can support. But Senator Rice, if it is malicious as you say, then no. 
Just before you start your question, Senator Keneally, I will remind senators on both sides of the chamber that interjections are always disorderly. I do need to be able to listen to both the question and the answer. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Mr. Morrison stood up this morning to say that it's a great shame the Treasurer has to be offered personal protection because of his Jewish faith. LNP MP George Christensen has previously appeared on a neo-Nazi podcast and has repeatedly posted anti-Semitic content on his Telegram, referencing the Great Reset and global elites, as well as anti-Semitic imagery. Does Mr. Morrison think these anti-Semitic posts from Mr. Christensen are not serious enough to even warrant a conversation Order. with Senator Mr. Mr. Christensen? The order, order, Senator Sazelja, Senator Wong. The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Order. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, um, as uh, indeed Senator Cash was just discussing uh, around the topic of discrimination, discrimination, uh, or indeed uh, promotion of uh, extremism or attempts to vilify have no place, whether it be uh, on the grounds of somebody's gender or their sexuality or their age or their race yeah. or their faith. Um, and uh, on all of those matters, uh, they rightly deserve condemnation. Um, uh, Senator Keneally is uh, making a number of uh, assertions uh, in relation to what, uh, what is uh, being posted by the member for Dawson. Um, I don't have uh, details of those, but, uh, but and I'm sure Senator Keneally, uh, if she wishes, uh, can certainly provide them to me uh, at a later point. Uh, but, uh, but, Mr. President, uh, obviously uh, we would condemn uh, any such uh, actions that uh, promoted anti-Semitism, just as we would condemn it if it was uh, promoting, um, uh, promoting any sense uh, of uh, lack of tolerance of people of any other faith uh, or of any other uh, attribute that is worthy of respect. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave to table a copy of the social media post that I just referred to. Is leave granted? You can check them. Thank leave you. Is, leave is granted. My supplementary. Mr. Christensen has posted about Premier Palaszczuk, inciting comments featuring images of her with a hook nose and violent threats, such as suggesting a noose was needed, sharing details of which ven venue she visits, suggesting someone harass her, asking where Lee Harvey Oswald is, and calling for public execution from a tree. Does Mr. Morrison think Mr. Christensen's posts are not serious enough to even warrant a conversation with him? Minister. Order. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, as I said uh, before, I said many times during the course of this week, and as the Prime Minister has said in relation uh, to condemning uh, those who Order. seek to incite any violence, a lack of the fact that we Order. do not accept, we do not accept any role for those uh, who promote uh, violence or intolerance. Uh, particularly on grounds in relation Order. to Senator faith, uh, particularly in relation uh, to any other personal attributes, the nature of which I spoke of before. Uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, there are, Order. Mr. President, Mr. President, there are clear, uh, there are clear um, pathways um, for action to be taken. Uh, Senator Keneally has referenced some of those Order, earlier this Senator week Keneally. in terms of if certain matters had been referred uh, to the police or otherwise. Uh, but in relation to these sorts of posts, which again you know, Senator Order. Keneally Senator may Keneally. find it helpful if she wants to ask about these things to provide copies of them in Minister, advance. Minister, your time has expired. Please resume your seat. Senator Keneally, a second uh, supplementary. I seek leave to table the posts that I just referred to. Is leave granted? There being Thank no you. objection, leave is granted. Will Mr Morrison now speak to Mr Christensen, who has fomented and stoked threats of violence and anti-Semitic sentiment for his own political benefit? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Mr President, as, uh, as I indicated earlier, um, that both prior to yesterday and subsequent to yesterday, uh, the leader of Mr Christensen's political party, uh, the National Party, has spoken Order. to him. On the remote order, 
Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Two days ago, it was reported that the Andrews Labor government in Victoria has refused to rule out mandating COVID-19 injections for school children in that state. Does the Morrison government support COVID-19 injections being forced on school children in Australia without written parental permission? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator Roberts, for his question. Uh, Mr. Question, Mr. President, um, all people who have a COVID-19 vaccine um, are asked to provide consent to the process. Uh, that's that's part of the process by which we've uh, put in place um, the vaccination program. Uh, we we ask those receiving the vaccine to provide a consent. Now, of course, in some circumstances, in sensitive sectors based on medical advice, uh, we have uh, put, uh, worked with the states to require some members of the workforce to have a vaccine. Aged care, for example, the health system and some frontline workers, people working in uh, circumstances where the risk of contracting COVID is very strong. But we have said from a national perspective all the way through that as much as possible it should be a voluntary process, Mr President. And I think the Australian people have demonstrated through their actions that they want to participate in the vaccination program. We're over 90 per cent first dose and well over 85 per cent second dose now. Australians have turned up in their droves to get vaccinated. And looking at the figures this morning, Mr. President, in the context of even boosters, uh, those who are currently eligible to take up a booster shot, which is a bit over 500,000 who, based on their date of vaccination, would have reached that six-month six period, uh, in excess of 75 per cent of those have turned up to pick up a to, to have a booster shot, Mr. President. So overwhelmingly, I think, uh, as the Australian people have demonstrated, firstly, their understanding of uh, the importance and the value of vaccination, uh, and they're turning up to get vaccinated. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. I thank the minister for his answer. What measures is the Morrison government taking to ensure that state and territory governments are unable to force COVID-19 injections on school children in Australia without written parental permission? Minister. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the Australian government continues to work cooperatively with the states with respect to the vaccine rollout through the forum of the national cabinet. Uh, obviously, the states and territories have, within their own realm, uh, some capacities with respect to mandates, and we've seen that play out in some states. But overwhelmingly, from a national perspective, the position of the Australian government uh, has been from the beginning and continues to be that the vaccination program should be a voluntary program. Uh, and as I've indicated to you in the answer to your primary question, Senator, through you, Mr. President, uh, Australians have overwhelmingly demonstrated their desire to be vaccinated because they know that we have safe vaccines, they know that the vaccines work, and they know that the vaccines will protect them, them their families and their communities, and that's important. Uh, Mr. President, and I would urge all states to ensure that they have a proper approval process, Minister, consent process, Minister, for the application time of vaccines. Has expired. Senator Roberts, a second supplementary. I again thank the minister for his answer. Last week, the prime minister stated that he did not support governments forcing injection mandates. Yet, state and territory governments are imposing these mandates on millions of Australian people to drive injections. What measures has the Morrison government taken to ensure that Australian federal, state and territory governments are not enforcing COVID-19 injection mandates? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, as I indicated uh, very early in the answer to the primary question, um, there, there is a requirement for Australians to provide consent or in the circumstance of a minor, a child between 5 and 11, 
for whom yet there is not a, an approved vaccine, uh, a consent to be provided. Uh, that's, that's the circumstance that uh, I've indicated. Uh, and I would expect that each state and territory comply with that process, that there is a consent provided. Uh, and uh, if there is, uh, for example, a rationale for a medical exemption, that would be take, taken into account as a part of that process. Uh, my experience so far of medical exemption is that they are very, very small. In the aged care workforce sector, for example, those that received medical exemptions was about 0.3 per cent. But uh, I would urge all states to ensure that the appropriate consents are obtained when providing Minister, vaccines to Australians. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is supporting the economic prosperity of Australian women as we reopen Australia and secure our economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Henderson for her question and her ongoing support for the future prosperity of Australia's women. On this day, where we recognise the importance of protecting Australia's women, Australia's women from violence, we should also, Mr President, acknowledge that the Morrison government is very much backing Australia's women to reach their full potential, because we know that when women succeed, Australia succeeds. When women participate fully in the economy, it's not just good for us, it's good for all Australians. And the Morrison government has put money, our money put money where our mouths are, investing $3.4 billion of new funding in through this year's women's budget statement, including investments in women's safety, their economic security and their health and wellbeing. Mm -hmm. Mr President, women are at the forefront of supporting the economic recovery from COVID-19. Under this government, the women's workforce participation rate is on an upwards trajectory and even in the face of the short-term impacts of lockdowns and the pandemic. Mr President, we are achieving this by creating more choices and more chances for more Australian women. The Morrison government has invested $1.7 billion to improve the affordability of childcare by increasing the childcare subsidy for families with multiple children. We know, Mr President, that these are the parents, the majority of whom are women who face the greatest challenges and disincentives on returning to work. We also have removed the annual subsidy cap to support the choices of Australian families when it comes to making that decision about balancing work and care. These changes are estimated to directly benefit around 250,000 Australian families, adding up to around 300,000 additional hours of work per week. The figure is the equivalent of around 40,000 individuals working an extra day per week, with a boost to GDP of around $1.5 billion every single year. Our focus is always on practical outcomes that make a real difference Minister, to women's lives, Minister, not thought bubbles, not headlines. Your time has expired. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question? Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the government is supporting Australian women to secure their economic future? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Mr. The, Mr. President, the Morrison government understands that the role of government is as an enabler and as a standard setter. And that's one reason why we're supporting more women into leadership positions and the jobs for the future. We know that women in STEM is not just a tagline, it's a lived reality and a, a priority in order to create the digital economy of the future. Careers in STEM are in demand and, crucially, are one of the highest paid sectors of our economy. Our government is committed to ensuring that there are more talented, educated and ready to lead women in the pipeline. We're investing $42.4 million over seven years to support more women with higher level STEM qualifications. And we're also supporting industry-led programs like SkillFinder to provide flexible micro-credentials that are in high demand. Additionally, we're partnering with universities to offer scholarships and identifying STEM fields with the highest growth potential to support women into the jobs of the future. These programs build on the successful Women's Leadership and Development Program, Minister, where we committed a Minister, further $39.8 million. Has expired. Senator Henderson, a Ex second supplementary. Thanks, Mr. President. Can the minister explain the importance of a collaborative approach across government and industry in reducing barriers to improve women's economic security? Minister. 
Thank you, Mr. President, and again, thank you, Senator Henderson. The Morrison government recognises that reducing the gender pay gap requires targeted policy and partnership between government and the private sector. But before I talk about what's, what's ahead, let me point out where we've come from. When we took office, the gender pay gap was 17.4 per cent, and now it is 14.2 per cent. Now there Order. is more to do. There is Order. more to do. And as a government, we believe that implementing policies Order should, in fact, shift the left. dial. Policies not put in place for show. We believe in Order implementing policies that shift left. that dial. Not policies that give millionaires free childcare. Millionaires Minister, free childcare, but Minister ones Hughes. that have real substance. Minister Hughes. That's why the women's budget statement. Resume statement. your seat. Order on my left. I couldn't possibly hear what the minister was saying. Once the chamber is silent, minister, you have the call. Thank you very Order. much, Mr. President. Senator That's Keneally. why we put in policies in place that actually shift the dial, Order. not Senator one like Wyatt. Labor's plan to give millionaires, millionaires free childcare, millionaires free childcare instead. Instead, that's why we put the women's budget statement in place and committed to a full review of the workplace gender or equity aid to determine how government can further encourage the private sector to do its bit Minister, to close the gender pay gap. Your time has expired. Order. Senator McKim. Thank you, uh, President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Immigration, Senator Cash. Minister, there are a large number of people in Afghanistan who were issued 449 visas by the Immigration Minister during the fall of Kabul. These visas were of three-month duration and are about to start expiring. DFAT advice during the fall of Kabul and since has been that Afghan nationals in Afghanistan who hold Australian visas should not attempt to leave Afghanistan due to the dangers of such a journey. Many who chose to ignore that advice are now safely in Australia. But those who followed the DFAT advice and stayed in Afghanistan are watching their visas run down and all your government is doing is advising them to apply for other classes of visa. The 449 visas represent a lifeline for people in danger, a lifeline you cannot in conscience snatch away. Will the minister do the right thing and extend those 449 visas and preserve the lifeline of safety from the Taliban that was offered three months ago? The minister representing the Minister for Immigration, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And I do thank Senator McKim for the question. And, uh, Senator Kim, I hope you would join with me in acknowledging that Australia does have a long and proud history of helping those who are most in need. Uh, in terms of the safety in particular of locally engaged employees uh, in Afghanistan uh, who have supported Australia's mission in Afghanistan, that is, I think you would have to acknowledge, and certainly the Minister for Foreign Affairs has done Minister, an outstanding job. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator McKim, on a point of order. Thank you, President. The point of order is relevance. The Minister's reading from a pre-prepared brief on um, locally engaged employees. That was most emphatically not part of the question I asked. I asked specifically about 449 visa holders. Senator McKim, I am listening to carefully to the Minister's answer. She has only been going for a very short period of time. Minister, I've given Senator McKim a chance to bring you back to the question, but I am listening carefully. Thank you. And Senator McKim, what I was saying was it's a high priority for the Morrison government, and that is why on the 18th of November 2021, the Australian government announced that the subclass 449 visas granted to Afghans who supported Australia's mission in Afghanistan and their families, who had not yet arrived in Australia, will be extended on an ongoing basis. This includes subclass Order. 449 holders who are certified locally engaged employees of the Department of Defence, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Australian Federal Police, and Order. other persons with working relationships with the Australian government. Order. It was also announced, Senator McKim, that those outside the locally engaged employee program who were granted a subclass 449 visa, which will expire, are to receive priority in Australia's humanitarian and refugee intake. 
Senator McKim, a supplementary question. Uh, very little or no comfort there, Minister. The government has said it will not return or refoul any uh, Afghan national currently in Australia. But what are you doing to ensure they have durable solutions in their lives, priority access to family reunion and pathways to permanent residency? Will you help these people and their families find permanent safety, or will you continue to leave them in limbo with the threat of being returned to Afghanistan hanging over their heads? Uh, Attorney General. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. McKim. Again, I would hope you would acknowledge that certainly when it comes to the safety of those uh, who are locally engaged employees, um, Australia is doing what it can, and we have put in place what is a high priority for our government. In that regard, I do commend the Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, for her involvement in this process. Mr. President, for evacuees who have already applied for a permanent visa, Senator McKim, such as a family skilled or humanitarian visa, the Department of Home Affairs they will continue Minister, to process Minister, that application. Minister, resume your seat. Senator McKim, on a point of order. Uh, again, President, the uh, same point of order as previously on relevance. This question is not about evacuees. This is about any Afghan nationals currently in Australia on temporary visas. That was very clear in the question. Very clear. I, and I can't believe the minister hasn't got a brief on this, Senator by the way. Senator McKim, you don't need to add commentary. Um, I, you have brought the minister back to the question. I'm listening very carefully to the minister's answer. Um, minister, I would remind you that there is a requirement to uh, answer the question, um, and I would give you the call. Thank you. And Senator McKim, to the extent that I don't have the information you are seeking, I will seek to get it. I am trying, however, to provide you with the relevant information that I do have in terms of, in particular, the permanent pa visa pathway for Afghan refugees. Um, and as I was actually saying, on the 12th of November of this year, Australia's migration law changed to allow Afghan evacuees in Australia who hold a subclass 449 visa to, to apply for an offshore humanitarian visa. Senator McKim, a second supplementary question. Thank you, President. Minister, there are just under 7,500 Afghan nationals outside Australia who are waiting to have their partner visas process. These are partners of Australian citizens or permanent residents. Some are in hiding in Afghanistan at risk of imminent death, and that includes, of course, many women and children. Many thousands have been waiting for years for their partner visas to be processed. Will the minister issue them 449 visas so they can come to Australia and be safe while their substantive visas are being processed? Attorney General. Uh, well, again, Senator McKim, the government, as you would know, we recognise the importance of family reunion for refugees and humanitarian entrants. Um, you would also know that our humanitarian program reunites refugees and people who are in refugee-like situations overseas with their family in Australia. Senator McKim, a point uh, of order. Once again, on relevance, this is not about refugees. The question was not about refugees or humanitarian visas. It was about people who are partners of Australian citizens and permanent residents who had applied for partner visas. That is not Senator about refugees or humanitarian entrants. I ask you Senator to draw McKim. the minister to the question. I, I will allow you to draw the minister to the question. I've been listening. I do not yet believe that I can say that the minister is not directly relevant. I will give the minister the call and I am the Senator Wong. I'm Mr. Ruling. President, I'm sorry. I'm asking you to rule. Have you, have you, are you ruling there is no point of order? I am ruling that. No, I'm ruling there is no point of order. Right. I'm listening carefully to the answer. On the point of order, before you formally rule, or if you haven't, uh, just uh, put put uh, to you, uh, Senator McKim. Uh, is asking about a completely different class of visa to the class that the minister is speaking about. It is not relevant, and I make that submission to you, consistent with our previous submissions over the last few days, about your role in calling the minister to the question. Senator Wong, I, um, the minister has only had part of the time to answer the question. I can, I do not believe I have 
enough information to yet assess whether the minister is being directly relevant. We, I have allowed Senator McKim to call the minister back to the question, and I am listening carefully. Attorney General, you have the call. Thank you, and Senator McKim. Um, if I can get any further information for you, I will. You clearly do not want any information in relation to what the Australian government is doing uh, for Afghan locally engaged employees, etc., more generally. But to the extent that I can get further information from the minister, I'll do that. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Is the Morrison Joyce government prepared to consider an override of existing vaccine mandates, as has been proposed by Senators Rennick and Antic? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and as I indicated in my answer to um, Senator Roberts earlier, uh, the position of the Australian government has always been through the vaccine program that vaccination as much as possible should be a voluntary process. And Australians, as I also indicated in my answer to that question, have overwhelmingly turned up to be vaccinated. We are at almost we are at almost 92 per cent first dose and we're in excess of 86 per cent second dose. And as I indicated to the Chamber before, of the 508,000 Australians who are eligible for a booster dose, uh, over 375 of those people, 75% uh, 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 have Minister, turned up for a vaccine. Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Wong, on a the point of order. Point of order is direct relevance, uh, and I'd refer you to the remarks of Senator Ryan when he held this position. That you know, obviously, short, sharp questions are much. Uh, do require a greater degree of relevance. Senator Ciccone's question was a very simple question, not about vaccine, Australians getting vaccinated. It was a simple question about whether the government is prepared to consider an override of vaccine mandates as some coalition senators proposed. That was the only topic raised. Uh, I, I, I will agree with Senator Wong to the extent that um, this was a fairly narrowly phrased question. So, Senator Birmingham, sorry, were you seeking? No, sorry. Um, fairly narrowly phrased question. I am listening carefully to your answer. I do note that you have only been speaking for a short part of your answer so far. Uh, I will bring you back to the question, however. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And I'll go back to the beginning of my answer, where the first thing I said was that the Australian government's position, the Australian government's position all the way through has been that as much as possible, the vaccination program for Australians should be uh, a matter of choice as much as possible. There are some mandates in place that have been supported by health advice uh, provided to the AHPPC, uh, and that, that has been worked through with the states, and the states have put in place, through public health orders, supports, Order. uh, supports for uh, those processes, for, public, for health workers, for uh, frontline health workers, for aged care workers, for home care workers, uh, and a number of others, Mr President. Uh, so, in some circumstances where the health advice has indicated that, we have supported the process of mandates, Mr. President. But we have said all the way through Minister, that our position Minister, has not changed. Minister, resume your seat. A point of order, Mr. President, my point of order is relevance. Uh, again, uh, just making the point that the minister now, with only 30 seconds left, has not yet gone to the very short, very direct question will they override existing va va vaccine the mandates? Uh, uh, Minister Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, on, uh, on the point of order in this regard, Mr. President, uh, the, uh, the opposition is now seeking to dictate the terms in which a minister answers the question. Uh, you, uh, you did bring the minister's attention to the question previously. Uh, the minister has been directly addressing issues in relation to mandates as they apply to the vaccination rollout. Uh, the minister has, uh, has clearly been addressing those issues Senator in Wong. relation to mandates and the voluntary application of the vaccine rollout. Uh, that, uh, that is directly relevant to the question. The fact the opposition may be seeking a yes or no type answer uh, is not, uh, not indeed, as many presidents have ruled very clearly, uh, not within the power of the president to define how a minister answers the question. Uh, the answer needs to be directly relevant to the question, and Senator Colbeck, by addressing issues around vaccine mandates, is clearly being directly relevant. 
Senator Wong, on the point Thank of order. Thank you. On the point of order, that last submission to you is clearly not consistent with precedent, and if you wish to take advice, we certainly would be happy for you to do so. Secondly, we are not seeking a yes or no answer. We simply want to know, want him to address the issue of override. He has not gone near the issue of override, and that was the question. I've been listening very carefully to the minister's answer, and in stating the government's position directly in relation to the question, I think that is being directly relevant. I am happy to review the Hansard on this, but I am happy to give the call back to Senator Colbeck at this point if he wishes to continue. Thank you, Mr President. And I will, as I was just doing, restate the government's position again, uh, which has not changed. Which has not changed. That the mandate the, that the vaccination program for Australians should be a voluntary program. Uh, where at all possible. That I have indicated with on health advice through AHPPC and the National Cabinet, the Federal Government, the Commonwealth Government has supported uh, some level of mandate. But the position of the Australian Government has not changed that, that this should be a voluntary Minister, program where at Minister, all possible. Your time has expired. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. Has the government sought any advice on overriding existing vaccine mandates? And if yes, when and for what purpose? Good Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as I've indicated a number of times already, um, and I'm prepared to do again, the government's position with respect to uh, the vaccination program is that it should remain voluntary. Mr. President, the mandates Order. that are being applied in states and territories are mandates that are being applied under state and territory law, not Commonwealth law. Uh, those the, the Commonwealth's position in respect of those is that the mandates should be appropriate and proportionate in identified high-risk settings, events and contexts, and should be given effect through state and territory public health orders, which is exactly what's happened through the process, oh, Mr President. Minister, but our position Minister, throughout— Minister, please resume your seat. On a point of order, yes, Senator on direct relevance, um, I think for the second time, been very specific. Has the minister sought any advice? And that was the heart of the question that I asked. I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. You've brought him back to the question. I will continue to listen to the minister's answer. Minister, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And so the, the government's position has not changed throughout the administration of the vaccination program. Uh, and I've indicated to you through uh, that the, the the circumstances under which uh, they should apply, Mr. President, and I will take on notice whether there's been any advice been uh, requested by the government. Senator Ciccone, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the minister rule out making any change to arrangements which allow states and territories to enforce vaccine mandates in order to secure? The votes of Senator Rennick and Antic. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Senator, um, this is this, this is as Senator McKenzie indicates the state's house. Uh, however, the government's position with respect to the vaccine rollout has not changed. And just because Senator Senator Ciccone asks me the same question in a different way doesn't mean that I'm going to have to give a completely different Order. answer. Uh, Mr. President, the government's position Order. with respect to this is completely clear. Completely clear, Mr. President. Uh, we, we, we have a position that's been consistent all the way through, and we maintain Order. that position that the, 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 the vaccination program, where at all Senator possible, Keneally. should be a voluntary program, except for the circumstances that I've indicated through the answers that I've given today. Mr. President, Wong. it's a clear Senator Wong. and it's a consistent position that we have provided all the way through, Mr. President. And just because the Labor Party try and ask the same question in a different way doesn't mean that I'm going to change my answer. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family <laughs> Businesses, Senator Cash. Can the minister please outline to the Senate how the Liberals and Nationals in government are putting in place the framework for small and family businesses to have the confidence to invest as we secure Australia's economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic? 
The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Davey for her question. And in particular, I acknowledge all the work that Senator Davey does with rural and Order. regional small businesses. Uh, and in particular, in the lead up to Christmas, where each and every one of us uh, should be looking to spend whatever money we can Senator with our small Ames. and family businesses around Australia. Mr President, as we all know, small and family businesses, they are the lifeblood of the Australian economy. Senator and in Ames. particular, when it comes to our rural Minister, and regional Minister, communities. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Ayres, I have called you to order by name three times. Cease interjecting. Attorney General. Thank you very much, Mr President. And these businesses, as we know, despite, despite the comments from Senator Ayres across the chamber, these businesses have been the key to Australia's economic recovery. Now, Senator Ayres, colleagues, through an interjection, has said, talk about jobs, talk about employment. Order. What can I tell you? Senator O'Sullivan. Sorry. Thank you. Well, I can tell, tell you, Senator, it's on this side of the chamber, we were always happy to talk about jobs. Let me assure you, because since we were elected to government, businesses out there, the economy has created almost 1.4 million jobs. You look at where Treasury said unemployment would be at the outset of COVID. And Senator Rares, you look at where unemployment is now. It is because of the policies put Senator in place Ayres. by the Morrison and Joyce government, the Morrison and Order. Joyce government, that so many more Australians have worked than otherwise Order. would have, Mr On President. Right and in and particular, what we want to do is say a big thank you to all of the small and family businesses out there. Order. Because colleagues, as you all know, those on the other side, the closest they've ever come to a small business is to close it down. Senator. That's what you want to do, close small businesses across Australia down. Just look at the tax policy you took to the last election. $387 billion in additional taxes. Senator Ayres, what would that have done to all of the small businesses in Australia? If you close Order. down the small business, people Order. lose jobs. That's right. You want to talk about jobs. You talk about job losses. We talk about backing Australians each and every way and making Order. sure, Mr President, they have a job. Minister. Senator Davey, before I go to your supplementary question, uh, Attorney General, I would remind you to direct your remarks through the chair, not through another senator. Senator Davey. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Minister, for that response too. Can you also explain how the government's plan for lower taxes has helped to create more jobs, as opposed to what Senator Ayres has been claiming, more jobs and put more money back into the pockets of workers and businesses across Australia? Attorney General. Well, Mr. President, this is just a continuation of what Order. was my answer to the first question. When it comes to lowering taxes, Senator Davies, as you know, that is just in the DNA of a coalition government. We will do everything in our power, Mr. President, to ensure that Australians themselves they are able to keep more of their own money, but also to all of those businesses out there, and in particular small and family businesses, that they are able to keep more of what they earn. That is in direct contrast, colleagues, direct contrast to those on the other side. Their gift to the Australian people, had they been elected at the last election, and you would have, you would have legislated it with the help of the Australian Greens, $387 billion in additional taxes. And Mr President, we know, we know they are still wed to that policy. And just weeks ago, we saw Labor was planning another hit Another hit, colleagues, not surprising to small and family businesses, with $27 billion in higher taxes on 300,000 family businesses. What contempt for business in this country? Please resume your seat. Senator Davey, a second supplementary. Thank you. Why is it so important for us to continue to support small and family businesses, and what are the risks that would derail the small business-led economic recovery that we're on? Attorney General. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And yet Order. again, sorry, Mr. President. Sorry, no, Attorney General, you have the call. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, the reason we back small and family businesses and businesses generally in Australia, because Senator Perrin, as you know, they are the job creators in this country. Governments don't create jobs. What they do, Mr. President, is put in place the economic policies that can see businesses in Australia prosper, grow, create more jobs for Australians 
or. We will never be Senator Davey on the or side of the chamber. That is for those on the left. That is for those on the Labor side of politics. You don't like business for some reason, and yet business Business are the job creators in this country. And that is why, Mr President, we are proud in the Morrison Joyce government to back our job creators every step of the way. If there is a policy that we can put in place that will ensure that they have the capacity to prosper, to grow, to create more jobs for Australians, Mr President, that is exactly what we will do. We will back our small and family businesses, the job creators of this country, every Minister, single Minister, step of the Minister. way. Senator Sheldon. Thank you, uh, President. My question is to the Attorney General, Senator Cash. On the 13th of October 2018, during the Wentworth by-election, Mr Morrison promised, and I quote, I will be taking action to ensure amendments are introduced as soon as practical to make it clear that no student of a non-state school should be expelled on the basis of their sexuality. Why did the Morrison-Joyce government promise that when it wasn't true? Uh, the Attorney General, Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, Senator Sheldon. I actually disagree uh, with the statement that you have made. Uh, the Prime Minister was very clear in the work he is undertaking. In the first instance, we said that we would refer what Senator uh, Sheldon has referred to, to the Australian Law Reform Commission. Order. The reason we have done that is because Order. they are now undertaking a broad review of all exemptions for religious bodies in discrimination law across Australia. At the same time, we implemented the Religious Freedom Review, and today was the culmination of that. The Prime Minister himself introducing into the House of Representatives the Religious Discrimination Bill to ensure that Australians of faith and those not of faith should not be discriminated against because of their religion. And Senator Sheldon, as you know, the Prime Minister has been very, very clear in relation to students. I have formally written to the Australian Law Reform Commission and I have made it very, very clear the government's Order. view in relation to students. No student should be expelled from a school because of their sexuality. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. When the Attorney General's Assistant Minister, Senator Stoker, was asked to respond to evidence that some students had been expelled over their sexuality, she said, and I quote, look, I'm not going to split hairs over that. Does Senator Cash agree with Senator Stoker that protecting LGBT kids from discrimination is splitting hairs? Order, 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 order on my right. Attorney General. Thank you. And uh, Mr. President, it is a great shame that Senator Sheldon, whom I actually have respect for, comes into this chamber and demeans the Religious Discrimination Bill and all that it stands for. It is a great shame that he is deliberately, probably for a political point, and I've tried to depoliticise this, Senator Sheldon. I have tried to depoliticise this Order. and bring forward a practical Order. bill that could get bipartisan support. It is a great shame that you come into this chamber and you verbal Senator Stoker. Senator Order. Sheldon, you will be aware, because it was, Senator, it was a former Attorney General Dreyfus who, in 2013, when amendments were made by the then Labor government to the Sex Discrimination Act in extending what protected attributes are, you actually were the ones, and we agreed with you, that should extend those exemptions to religious bodies. To just come in here and play politics, shame on you. Order, order, order. Senator Sheldon, a second supplementary. On the 11th of October, Order. Senator Wong. On the 11th of October, Senator Canavan. On the 11th of October 2018, Mr. Morrison promised to change the law to protect LGBT kids from discrimination. And I quote: "Before the end of the year, can the minister confirm at the earliest the Morrison Joyce government will actually consider reform to protect LGBT kids from discrimination?" Is 2000. 
and 23, five years after Ms. Morris, Mr Morrison made his promise. Attorney General. Thank you, Mr President. And again, Senator Sheldon, what I can confirm is this. There are a number of exemptions in place for religious bodies, including religious educational institutions, under anti-discrimination law in Australia. The Labor Party actually agrees with those exemptions. You did nothing whilst you were in government to change them. And in fact, as I said in 2013, when Mr Dreyfus was the former Attorney General and did add some protected attributes to the Sex Discrimination Act, in his second reading speech he made it very clear that the exemptions that religious bodies, including religious educational institutions, currently had would continue. They would be Order. extended. Order so, Mr President, left. if those on the other side are saying that you want to completely get rid of these exemptions, you're going against everything you have ever stood for. The Prime Minister has made it clear no child, no student Order. should be expelled from a school Order. because of their sexuality. Minister. I ask the further questions placed on notice. Give senators a moment to exit the chamber. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Oh, Senator Mariel Smith. Yeah, I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Rustin to the question asked by Senator McAllister. Deputy President, before I begin, I want to recognise the victim survivors both in this place and across Australia, far too many of whom were taken from their friends and families by this violence, impacted by this violence. And I especially want to acknowledge it today on the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. We know in this chamber that violence, family violence, domestic violence, sexual violence is rife in our community. And we know that the pandemic, in many ways for many women, has made it worse. The minister said in her answers to questions today that the impact of violence didn't end during the pandemic. Absolutely correct, absolutely correct. But what she didn't acknowledge is that for too many women, it has worsened. And it has worsened at a time when there are enormous other pressures on women, on their families as well. It has worsened at a time where we need support and action on this issue from the government more than ever. One woman is killed every week by a current or former partner. We know police are called to domestic violence incidents every two minutes. Violence is a leading preventable cause of death, illness and disability for women aged 15 to 44. And a 2017 report by White Ribbon found that women in First Nations communities are twice as likely to be victims of violence. As I said, the pandemic has caused significant spikes in family violence, with two thirds of providers reporting an increase in abuse and especially in controlling behaviours. In October 2020, the Women's Legal Service in Adelaide reported having to turn away 450 calls from women earlier that year during the first waves of lockdowns and quarantine in South Australia. Yet in the context of this, in the context of all that we know, the Abbott Turnbull Morrison government for too long failed to take seriously the task of delivering leadership on women's safety. Now, following the March for Justice, the Prime Minister announced his Women's Cabinet and the Women's Budget with great fanfare. But six months later, we're still waiting. We are still waiting for the draft national plan. And organisations are yet to receive the funding promised by this government. In just February last year, it was reported that dozens of trials in the family court were directly impacted by funding shortfalls in legal aid. Refuges have reported having to turn away women, and only one in 10 women who want to stay at home have the necessary support to safely do so. 
The lack of leadership, though, isn't just here from the federal government in Canberra. It exists in my home state of South Australia as well, where we've seen the only domestic violence shelter in Adelaide, the dedicated one for women without children, Catherine House, being subject to a $1.2 million funding cut. Now, senators in this place, I know Senator Wong has a close relationship with Catherine House. I know Senator Farrell does too. Senator Grogan and myself, we have visited this service firsthand many times. We've seen the incredible and important work they do for some of the most courageous women in our state, and they had $1.2 million worth of funding cut. At the federal level and the state level, we hear platitude after platitude. But what we've failed to see delivered, not just this year, but over years and years, indeed decades and decades, is the meaningful commitment of resources with the right level of urgency required to support women, to support families with violence. Victim survivors need so much more support, and I am so proud of Senator McAllister, and I am so proud of our leader, Anthony Albanese, who have just announced that a Labor government will fund 500 new community sector workers to support women and families fleeing family violence and establish a Commonwealth Family, Domestic and Sexual Violence Commissioner to give victim survivors a strong voice at the highest levels. Domestic family and sexual violence is an epidemic in our community. For many women and families, it remains an unseen burden which endangers their lives and livelihoods. To make Australia a fairer and safer place, we must drag this horror into the light and deliver real and meaningful action to protect women and families from abuse and violence. Labor is committed to this. In government, we will deliver this because we heed the calls for urgency and the women and families who cannot wait any longer. Thank you, Senator Mariel Smith. The time has expired. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Deputy President, and uh, I, I thank Senator Smith for raising this very, very important issue, particularly on this day, which is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Family, sexual and domestic violence um, cannot be condoned or tolerated, and our government is absolutely committed to doing all we can to try and eliminate family and domestic violence from our nation. However, it is everyone's business. We must remember that we need to educate our young people so that they understand what coercive control, what domestic violence is, and so that they, from a very young age, know how to see it, know how to call it out, and know how to stop it. Um, our government has provided funding. Uh, contrary to what Senator Smith was saying, our government has delivered a landmark $3.4 billion women's budget statement in the 2021-22 budget. This had a record $2 billion investment for women's security initiatives uh, since 2013, which includes $1.1 billion in the latest women's budget statement. We've held summits a national summit on women's safety, and we are currently developing the next national plan to end violence against women and children. And that includes investing $22.4 million over five years to establish a domestic family and sexual violence commission. Now, as I've said before, this commission does not absolve anyone else of responsibility in this issue, but it does establish a single point, a commission that can work with all governments, all community groups, to provide a crucial accountability mechanism to make sure that our collective efforts are focused on ending violence. Because uh, Senator Smith referred to uh, the Labor Party's commitment for 500 new frontline workers, and while that sounds commendable on the surface, you have to be concerned about where the funding for that is coming from. Will they be withdrawing the funding from the existing billion dollar investment that the Morrison government has made to work with the states, 
to work with the territories for domestic and family violence responses. We are working with them and we are funding <coughs> through a national partnership agreement because that way it ensures that our response is targeted, fit for purpose and meets local needs which differ across the country. And people here have highlighted quite rightly that the response in our remote and regional and indigenous communities is going to be different to the response that is rolled out in Sydney or Canberra. So rather than our government's approach is rather than Canberra dictating, like the Labor Party will, here's 500 new workers and we'll, we'll employ them, we'll put them in, the, in our offices. Our government's approach is rather than Canberra dictating how money must be spent, we are providing flexibility to those with the knowledge on the ground to allow additional support to span frontline services, to provide safe accommodation where needed, to provide perpetrator interventions and helplines and counselling services and training, because that, that is how we will help eliminate violence against women in this country. The support services that are needed, the training, early education, for all of our community so that we can all work together to end the scourge of domestic violence. Because across Australia, I would say that every single Australian knows someone who has been a victim of some form of family and domestic violence, but it is still not spoken about. And there are still many victims of domestic violence who do not speak about it who do not come forward. And we need to support those people, wrap our arms around them and say that we are here for them. We are listening for them and our government is committed to providing that support. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davey. <clears throat> I don't know who's got the call. Uh, it's the opposition. So who's got the call? Yes, Senator. Oh, sorry, Senator McCarthy. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the government's response to questions by Senator McAllister relating to the government's commitment to combat family, domestic and sexual violence. As Senator McAllister has told the place this morning, domestic and family violence is a national crisis and a national shame. We know this, the government knows this. Survivors and their advocates have been bravely speaking about this for years, calling for action from political leaders. Advocates like the Tungandura Women's Safety Group from Alice Springs, who were brought to Canberra in 2018. They travelled the thousands of kilometres from Alice Springs to meet with government ministers and urged the government to listen to them. They spoke about the work they do on the front line of family violence, and they showed other First Nations women and survivors of family violence that we can stand up and be heard. Well, that was three years ago. We're now eight years into this coalition government and they still don't seem to be taking this issue as seriously. They seem to be seen to be doing things, making announcements and promises without ever actually delivering. And we saw that in May when the government hastily cobbled together a woman's budget, a reaction to the nationwide marches for justice which were taking place right across the country. The government had to be seen to be doing something. So they promised $260 million in the budget to combat family, domestic and sexual violence, money that would be paid to states and territories to distribute to frontline services. So six months on, how much of that has been paid? Nothing, not a cent. I would say to those opposite in government, it is not good enough. Securing women's safety requires more than a media release on budget night. Instead, we've seen delayed announcements and indifference to this policy area. Even now, we're still waiting for a revised draft national plan, which was promised by November. The minister did say today it is in the final stages of its draft. Well, we certainly hope so. There's only five days left in November. And so how can Australians 
trust the government to deliver on its promises on domestic violence. It certainly can't. Uh, this government has failed to take action, really. And nowhere is this more apparent than here in the Northern Territory, which experiences the highest rates of domestic, family and sexual violence in Australia. On average, there are 61 domestic and family violence incidents per day in the Territory and four domestic and family violence related homicides per 100,000 people per year. First Nations women account for 89% of all victims in the Territory. Nationally, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women experience violence at roughly twice the rate of non-Indigenous women. It's past time to stop just talking about it and elevate women's safety to a national priority. I'm proud to say that Labor does have a plan. As announced this week, an Albanese Labor government will implement a new Family, Domestic and Sexual Violence Commissioner. This was a recommendation of a recent House of Representatives inquiry into family, domestic and sexual violence. Labor also supports calls for a separate national action plan for First Nations people to end violence against women and family violence. Labor will allocate an additional 4,000 units of social housing to women and children experiencing family violence and to older women on lower incomes as part of our Housing Australia Future Fund. We will also provide $100 million for crisis and transitional housing for women. And Labor will establish 10 days paid domestic violence leave because no woman should have to choose between her job and leaving an abusive situation. We have seen time and time again, the Morrison government say all sorts of things in this area. One of the most disappointing things uh, in particular this year is to have on the budget night, make a tremendous announcement for a significant amount of money to go to women's places right across Australia to combat family violence, $260 million. And here we are six months on, not one cent of the $260 million has been spent. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator McGrath. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Deputy President. And I'd like to, to begin by acknowledging what has taken place today uh, in the Senate, in that often uh, politicians and the Senate and, and the House of Reps is, is seen as a, as a, a place of, of Yabu politics. But what we've seen over the course of today, and not just in response to, to uh, this particular debate, but the debate earlier today, uh, is that, that serious issues are, are, are dealt with in a, in a manner that, that is appropriate and that as, as much as possible uh, politics is taken out of it because there is a common cause amongst politicians from across the, the political spectrum. And while there may indeed sometimes be different approaches to, to how to deal with, with such a pervasive issue as of, of family and domestic violence, that, that for those that, that who, who may be listening, you can be assured that, that, that the, this chamber is at one at understanding that there is a, 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 pan, a pandemic, a, a, a perverse scourge in, in Australia at the moment. Uh, that has been going on for some time in relation to, to family and domestic violence. And it, is, it should be reassuring to Australians that, 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 that this Senate and senators in this chamber do take that, that seriously. So uh, we should be assured by that. And, and today, as has been noted, is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Uh, and as speakers have, have pointed out previously to me, that. That, that a, a woman, and, and when you say a woman, it's, it's, it depersonalises in a way, but, but someone's you know, daughter or, or, or mother or sister uh, is killed by their partner every, every 11 days. And one in, one in five women over the age of 15 has, has experienced uh, sexual violence. And, and many of us in this chamber would mean that we, we do know people who have uh, experienced uh, su such violence. And over the course of 
the, the COVID pandemic, violence against women and girls has increased and physical distancing and lockdowns have made it harder for, for those women, those girls, those, those families to, to seek and receive help. And you know, this government is, is delivering unprecedented levels of, of resources towards Australian women's safety, towards their economic security, the health and wellbeing, and, and to support women achieve their, their full potential. And the 2021-2022 Women's Budget Statement invested a record $1.1 billion in, in women's safety, which did include $260 million for new national partnership agreements with the states and territories to increase the capacity of frontline support and crisis services. And we are now developing the next national plan to end violence against women and children as a blueprint to end violence in all forms. And one of the aspects of when we talk about family and domestic violence is that we should not just make the mistaken assumption that it is a, 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 a problem of, of a problem that is a women's problem or it's a men's problem. It is a problem that belongs to society and that all of us have a role to play and it should not just be uh, put in a box and, 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 ticked to such, and ticked to such. And that's why it is so reassuring that this government uh, is, is spending so much money to, to try and, and end this scourge and why across the chamber there is widespread agreement of, on, on the, the need to end this. Um, we've announced that, that the Morrison government will invest $2.8 million over three years to deliver the final stage of, of the Women's Voice project. And as Minister Rustin said in her, in her answer, uh, this will include a, a national summit for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women chaired by, by June Oscar Ao. We are listening to, to the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, and the summit will tell the development of how a First Nations action plan to end violence against Aboriginal and Torres Strait women and children. This action plan will be the primary mechanism for implementing closing the gap thank target you, 13. Senator McGrath, your time has thank, expired. Thank you, Deputy President. Senator Grogan. <coughs> uh, thank you. We've heard a lot today about violence against women and a lot of statistics. And in addition uh, to the unacceptable number of women killed in Australia by a violent partner or ex-partner, many, many more are regularly subjected to sexual violence, physical violence, humiliation and other forms of abuse. And we know from domestic violence services around the country that COVID-19 has exacerbated this for many women who have been forced to isolate with their abusers trying to keep themselves and their families safe. Just last night in my home state of South Australia, we had our Special Operations Police Star Force Group officers responding to an alleged assault on a woman that resulted in a four-hour siege. Now, let's just think about that for a moment. A woman all alone, living with and allegedly abused by a man who's willing to hold a paramilitary force at bay for four hours, with no anxiety, no fear about doing that. It's simply unimaginable what terror she must have experienced, and the kind of terror that she must have experienced over what you can only imagine is quite a lengthy period of time. In her own home, a place that she should be able to rely on to be safe in. Violence against women knows no barriers not socially, culturally or socioeconomically. And since the start of COVID-19, we've seen the number of reported offences against women rise considerably in South Australia and also across the rest of the country. While our community awareness is growing of this issue, which is a good thing, far too many women are continuing to live their lives in fear. Across Australia, refugees report turning away 50% of the women who seek support and help. And currently those who are at risk of experiencing domestic violence 
often cannot access any form of early intervention services or support services while they try and avoid ending up as one of these horrendous statistics that we've heard today. Women's organisations say that while they advise women to contact a crisis service at the point of crisis, because those are the only services they can access, they have nowhere to refer people in the earlier stages. There is no form of early intervention that is sufficient in Australia at this time. How can we leave so many women languishing in these hideous circumstances when the awareness of the issue is so widespread now? We must look at this issue holistically. We must elevate its status well above the standing that it currently has under the Liberal National Government. We see them talking a big game in here while cutting critical funding to services on the ground. Labor will elevate this issue. Labor will elevate and the Senator issue Brogan, of violence against um, women. If you would resume your seat, uh, because we have an order that, um, or decision of the Senate earlier today that at 3.30 we would move to the disallowance. So this matter is now concluded. So before I move to Senator Patrick, um, I'll move the motion moved by I've got to move this, take note. So I'm just moving the motion, um, moved by, uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Senator Smith, that uh, we take note of answers. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I'll call the clerk.